know why my video is going. Please stop. It's okay. nice to see you. I'm happy to see you again. It's been a minute. It has been a minute. Yes, it has. It's been a few months. I know <laughs> we were trying to to do this earlier on in my schedule and everything else. So nothing yes. like a ridiculous virus to put us all in our homes near a computer. <laughs> I know it really has um, changed a lot of things and what and what it's doing yeah which we are not having. discussing today we are we are if you need a break from covid we are here for this <laughs> yes we are here for this you know we can talk about other things when it comes to chronic illness and disability you know so Although all of us staying home there's a lot of people having some fun so I, I guess we can tie in that way as well. Yes people are having to get creative in their homes right now that's one of the things that has really been coming up in my therapy sessions with my clients is, what are you doing to keep yourself busy? What are you doing to keep yourself sexy? <laughs> As a therapist, what are you doing to keep yourself busy is a whole nother realm. <laughs> it really is. You can get very creative with things that are going on right now. That's the whole goal. So that's I definitely, <laughs> yeah, what people are looking for. You know, they're looking for new ways to get creative with their partners. Um, you know, it's so interesting. Like one of the things that I'm finding is that a lot of my folks that have chronic illness and disability um, that usually have low sexual desire, since this whole thing started and they are in their homes more, they have found like a little bit of peak with sexual desire. Wow. That's you know, <laughs> which has that been so neat. Fascinating. <laughs> it has been fascinating. Um, and it's one of the things that's really been coming up in sessions is, you know, the peak of sexual desire, how to get creative with sex, how to get creative with yourself while you're during this time. But, you know, virus or no virus. I mean, these are the things that tend to come up in the world of being a, a sex therapist that specializes in chronic illness and disability. So, you know, the thing about chronic illness and disabilities, we're all so um, primed for this experience. We've been home, most of us, for, for quite a bit of time anyway. So it's... Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I always joke that my sweats are my spoony lingerie. That's, you know, if you're really like amping it up, it's yoga pants. Like that is that is a special anniversary night is yoga pants with the off the shoulder sweatshirt instead of the full like introvert hoodie. Oh yeah, so you're yeah. spicing it up a little bit by, totally by getting, getting up I in. I have my Doctor Who sweatshirt, which like has like a little bit of shoulder action. It is, it is definitely hot up here. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah. So what different things can you wear in your spoonie gear? You know, <laughs> I mean, you know, we have so many bandages. There are so many options. You can go like full fifth element. If anyone's old enough to remember that movie and do the bandage. Oh yeah, sure. Great movie. Yeah. You can definitely go into bondage with that stuff. It's, you know. Oh yeah. Yeah. You can get creative with bondage gear. You know, maybe you can put some leather on too. I wish any of this was in my life, but um, <laughs> this is changing in my life. Uh, well, it's one of the things that have really been coming up in my work that um, okay. people that are, you know, that have chronic pain due to their chronic illness or just chronic pain conditions um, are really using different ways to cope with their pain. And one of the things that's coming up in the research that I'm doing that I'm talking about next Friday in a big workshop at the Integrative Sex Therapy Institute, and of course it's gonna be via webcast. Um, we are looking at how people are engaging in like BDSM behavior. Okay. To cope with good pain versus bad pain. That is freaking fascinating. Um, yes, how people yeah. are distracting themselves and focus on being whipped, doing some flogging, of course light impact, and how people are really gaining a sense of relief but also a sense of power so yeah i just had to take a little pause there just to um put my 12 year old on the other side of the house uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah but no i mean it's normal it's, it's everyone just, home <laughs> yeah yeah that usually doesn't happen um no but as you were saying about the the positive effects of bdsm with um pain that you plan instead of pain that you have no control over yes this is a very yes. different kind of thing is to <laughs> to actually right. plan yeah, yeah. Um, it, you know, I, you know, as a kink aware and polyamorous aware friendly therapist, I see a lot of different types of clients. And, you know, I do have my clients that are kinky and they're poly and they also have disability, chronic illness. And 
those are the things that come up. It's a good way to distract themselves. It's also a way to have some control and power because you know, with an illness, you don't have that, right? So being oh, able- Oh no, do tell me, I have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you don't know what? anything about that, right? I didn't just look so at you just... yesterday by trying to get down from the chicken coop. Absolutely not, that didn't happen, yeah. No, yeah, it's, yeah. yeah, control yeah. definitely seems like a theme in what, what you had written your show notes about. And that's, that's fascinating. Yes. So control, being able to hold control and how you feel and, you know, being able to switch up your roles in the bedroom. So it's interesting. A lot of my clients that um, have chronic pain, chronic illness, they will engage and be in the role of a dom or, wow. or in BDSM culture. We, you know, you call it a top. If you're a top, you know, you're more of the dom. If you're a bottom, you're more of the sub. And so being able to take those controls and to be able to do something different to distract yourself, it's like playing a role or something. It's really interesting how it comes up in therapy. And of course, consensual and all of that. But it's just, a, it's a nice relief for people. It's a nice way to be able to cope with pain in a different way. So how can you help people explore this? Like someone who is not familiar with these, or their only familiarity is like some of the, the books that have come out lately. Like how do you help people? Well, there's a lot of different online resources. In DC, we have the Black Rose Community Group where they have meetings. There's a local dungeon here in DC where people can go and they have Dungeon 101 and they teach you everything about it, um, which I think is fascinating. So I refer a lot of folks to that. I try to refer refer people to some books though but um but if they really want to have the experience and if they are partnered they can go with their partner or they can go with a group of friends it's really important to be involved in a sense of community i think being in a sense of community really helps folks um when it comes to looking at bdsm and one of the things that i do with them is we talk about the different language in it because it does have its own language. So for those that don't know, BDSM, you know, the B and the D is bondage and discipline. The, um, the, 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 D, the D and S is also dominance and submission. And the S and M is sadism, sadism and masochism. So sadism is where you like to inflict some type of psychological, physical response. And the masochism is where you like to receive it. And so there's different code words too, you know, rack, which is risk aware, consensual kink. There's different safe words that people use. You can use the traffic light. Green means to go. Yellow is to slow down and red is to stop. So there's different like things that we can do as sex therapists to help people when they're wanting to engage in some other way and they're sex positive to cope with pain. So, you know, this has just recently been coming up in a lot of my sessions. And so I find it to be, um, you know, serious, like definitely quite fascinating with everything that's taking place right now in the world of coping with pain and disability. So for people who are not, um, if BDSM is not saying that appeals to them, is there another way that they can um, explore pain uh, control and sexuality? Absolutely. Well, you know, it's all about communication. Sex at its heart is about communication and it's getting creative. So if you have a partner, it is um, talking with them about what brings you pleasure. I always tell folks that, you know, lay out your body is like a blueprint. Lay, it, lay that out and find out the sensations that feel good to you, you know, and communicate that. And if it's your, if it's your hand, if it's your leg, whatever that is, those are the things that can help bring a lot of pleasure to your body, especially if sex and penetration or something is out of the question, right? Mm -hmm. So there's different ways to get creative um, if you're someone that does not engage in kink or BDSM. Um, and those are the things that I tend to really recommend to my clients when we're talking about this when it comes to sexuality. Because of course, um, there's so many misconceptions with disability, you know, and sexuality, there's the idea that people that have disability, they are not sexual, right? Or they are told to be asexual. Um, I have so many clients that come into my office who are partnered or they're single, and they're constantly telling me, you know, Dr. Phillips, I was raised in a home where I was treated like a child. And I was told that I 
could not be in relationships. I could not be sexual. And here I am and I'm wanting to be sexual. Mm. And, and how so did someone take that first step from being infantilized into a consensual sexual relationship? Well, we talk about what it is that they are sexual about, right? What is oh, sexuality? <laughs> yeah, what are, what are you, what do you like about sex? What, what defines your sexuality? How do you express yourself sexuality, your, your sexuality? You know, there's a lot of research that talks about that um, people have sexual rights and people want to be sexual, but what we're seeing on the lack in the research is how do people express themselves and how do they negotiate their needs with their partners who have disability? Mm. And so the way that we do that is, first of all, we have to define what does sex mean to them? Um, you know, what does disability mean to them? You know, we're in a culture where, um, you know, when you think about disability, what comes to your mind? You know, is it, do you immediately think about someone in a wheelchair? or another form of physical disability, or maybe you think about other disabilities that affect the body. What does your disability mean to you? I think for so long, everything was a medical model, mm. right? And doctors and psychologists really defining what disability is, but what does disability mean to the person that has disability? <laughs> That's an interesting question that I don't know many people who get asked that, even those of us who do use wheelchairs. Right, that's, that's like what, absolutely. What does it mean? What does it mean to you? Because you know, some people, when we look at the social model, how it encompasses everything, um, you know, a lot of folks, their the goal is is to really embrace your your disability. And some folks, they after years of having it and they're wanting to be sexual, they can finally get to a place where maybe they can do that. You know, and everyone's on their own journey with it. So those are the first things that we really talk about. Um, with sexuality and disability. And what does that mean to them? And what does a relationship look like to them? You know, um, and so having to uncover that. And when you're a gender minority, that's a whole other layer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, that's a, a fascinating point. I mean, I, I do talk to a lot of other um, cis women who are dealing with the concept of what is sexuality to someone who's grown up where, especially those of us who grew up in the 90s, where all the rap was incredibly degrading and the ads were always selling a body. So it's like, well, if you want to dress sexy, is that something that was just sold to you as what's sexy? Or do you actually find that mm. sexy? And I'm sure that there's a lot of people who, you know, I'm just talking from personal experience, but I'm sure there's a lot of people who can relate to that in their own, in their own sphere. But that is a question of like, what did we get told is sexy and hot and what is actually something we find sexy in and of ourselves. Yes, and it's so critical. And by doing that, that's when you find out how, of a, how much of a sexual being you are and who are you as a sexual being. I mean, I'm telling you, the Doctor Who sweatshirt is hot. I mean- The Doctor Who? <laughs> my Doctor Who sweatshirt is totally sexy. Oh. <laughs> <Hot>. <laughs> Oh boy. Yeah. But that's how we start those conversations. That's how we do it. You know, we talk about what is it that you're really wanting to do and how do you explore with your body? Um, you know, I have a, have you ever talked to Andrew Gerza? I don't think so. He's, he's amazing. He is a queer disability activist and you know, he talks a lot about being in, he suffers from cerebral palsy and he talks a lot about being in your body and really identifying what is great to you as a sexual being. And so mm -hmm. one of the things that really comes up in my sessions is, you know, and he talks about this too, is really talking about solo sex and masturbation and way different ways that you can masturbate. And that's really been coming up in my work too with people having to do social distancing right now, you know, getting creative again with their sexuality. Um, we're so quick to go to porn. And so one of the things that has been coming up is, um, what about erotic literature? Reading again, you know, folks are finding that to be amazing. And when they're looking at how to be sexual in their bodies, that's one of the things that I've been recommending, erotic literature, looking at different things. And the idea of whatever happened to phone sex, I guess I went to FaceTime, but <laughs> I, I'm old. 
friends. Um. Yeah, but you know, people are starting to get back into that again and finding that to be exciting. Um, that was coming up too in, in a lot of my work lately and some of the research that I've been doing. And so, but when you are a gender minority, someone who's trans, non-binary, LGBTQ, and you're wanting to come out with a disability, you know, having to do a coming out process all over again. That yeah. can be challenging. <laughs> yes, I, and it, just to go back to masturbation for a minute, um, mm -hmm. again, cis female perspective here is, um, it was never assumed that, that we had masturbated. It was actually like a, like an incredibly shameful idea that at least in the spheres that I was in and then, you know, growing up in the 90s was like, that was just unthinkable and disgusting. And so there was this huge level of shame around it. And to the point that I didn't know any woman in my groups that actually knew what anything looked like or what it was until we used tampons where we got the yeah. actual grout. I was like, I, I had no idea any of this was there. Like, and it's, it's so interesting to like, you own, um, if you own a vagina, if you're an owner of one of these things, like it's not something that's there. It's not saying assume that you're going to be touching it. So to, um, get people past that idea of and even understanding how to like it's mm -hmm. not you know you had american pie which was like this whole movie that is this entire like exactly. almost how-to manual for men like it's just uh, the whole movie is about masturbation and like how this is just absolutely the thing that happens for owners of penises and it's like mm -hmm. okay but there's mm -hmm. nothing that you know is outside mm -hmm. of i mean even if you watch pornography you're not going to generally see even female masturbation that would necessarily work it's well, you're not, and, then, visual. It, and you're yeah. not, and that's why it's so important to talk about pleasure and what pleasure means to people and how do they explore their pleasure and what pleasure does, right? You know, it, it is a foundation of affirmations for people. I mean, people really enjoy doing that. And, it, and, and the goal is to really find out, well, what feels good to you as an individual other than everybody else, right? Yeah. Um, if you are a woman, or if you are a trans person, or a non-binary person, or you're a person with disability, or or you're a person that is trans and non-binary and you have a disability, um, that's not talked about. <laughs> it's not it's not discussed. Um, like what what you were saying with men, yes, I mean that that's always coming up, right? But we don't really see. You that. didn't even stop at the pun. My God, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> That was a good pun right there. Just <laughs> had to throw that in. I'm a sexual yeah. 12. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but that's what happens. That's what happens. That's what gets yeah. talked about. It, it, you know, it's not talked about if you are a trans woman um, with a disability and you're wanting to be sexual. You know, that doesn't come up. And I'm so glad that I can hold a space and have people that can come in who are trans and who can talk about what sex means to them and, and what sexuality is. And, and someone who is transitioning into finally another body and having gender euphoria, which of course is amazing when people can feel that about themselves. Can you um, give a quick definition for gender euphoria? Gender dysphoria is basically- Oh, it's the dysphoria, opposite. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I thought oh, you said gender, dysphoria, well, gen and I was no, like, gender, wait a minute, I've never heard no, that one before. Well, gender euphoria, it's the, it's the opposite of gender okay. dysphoria. So it's actually being, it's being more comfortable in your body and owning your body and feeling great in your body. And, and you know, sometimes it takes a while to get there and to really feel that. I, I have a big problem with gender dysphoria. I feel like it labels people and it gives people this um, idea that you are disabled and you can't be, and, and it puts, I think it, um, it, path, it's, it does a lot of pathology with it, right? Where if you, Yes, there can be this dysphoria about not being in the body that you want to be in, but when you label that, it's like a diagnosis. And I think we're trying to get more out of, we're trying to get away from that. That's gender dysphoria. <laughs> Direct gender dysphoria and clicking headphones. Um, so I just have to stop you there because what really is hitting me in the solar plexus is your idea of like that feeling of belonging in your body and your body not being a mutiny. and. I think anyone even without gender dysphoria has that feeling if you are chronically ill or disabled of, of living in something that is a mutiny. Yes, it's a great point. Absolutely. Yeah. So how do we do that? Because I, I get accused all the time of calling my body an it. I always 
third person the body. So how do you get to a place where something that causes you such tremendous pain or discomfort or disassociates from gender or disassociates from what you want to to be? How do you how do you make terms with being in this avatar? Well, I think that you know you have to look at where you're at in your journey with chronic illness and disability. You know, um, when I you know when at first when people are first diagnosed with a chronic illness you know, the biggest thing is there's, there's a crisis phase there and there's a rejection of you not wanting to be into your body. That's one big thing that I see a lot when I have people that come into therapy. You know, the second phase that folks go through is the stabilization. They're wanting a diagnosis. Some people, it, it's, it's different for each client that I see. You know, some folks, they want a diagnosis. Some do not want a diagnosis. They want to go into a denial factor. And so they reject their body that's a that that that's usually the, one of the most common things that I see as a therapist that specializes in chronic illness, and then the third stage that I see folks go through is this integration phase um, of wanting to integrate their old self into their new self, mm. and that can be a challenge because they can't always you can't do that right. You're having to give into a new body, and that's really hard for folks. So by coming into the therapy process and talking about the grief that happens. There's a grief that comes with chronic illness, you know? And a lot of times that first stage is that denial factor. So when you move past that and you go into this integration phase where you are integrating your new body into your old body, but, or your old body into your new body, trying to, to form, to, to combine both of those, that's when I see people wanting to be sexual again. It's almost like they have actually accepted where they are in their body, and now they're wanting to explore other avenues of things. And one of those that comes up is sex, but I usually don't see it until they really get into that integration phase. When there's this stabilization phase, um, you know, a lot of times sex is the last thing they wanna talk about. They're not sexual. There's a lot of low sexual desire. And so working in that process with them to do that is where you start to see a change. Um, and it's a journey. It takes a lot of time. You know, I have different people that come in with different phases. You know, they may come in where they have done the work, they've accepted their illness, they're starting to live with their, their new body, what they're needing to do, learning to listen to their body more, knowing when they need to take breaks, knowing when they need to set limitations. And that's where they wanna explore other avenues. Um, so in my work, that's what I've mostly, that's how I've dealt with that as a therapist. So what are some things that someone can do once, if they feel like they're at a place where they're starting to get past the crisis point and they're mm -hmm. wanting to just start to move more into being in their bodies? Is there some exercises or some things that you can a think of that could help? Sure. Yeah. A lot of what I always recommend, this is a good classic one that John Kabat-Zinn used to do back in the day for chronic pain is doing a body scan knowing in your body where your sensations are and paying attention to that because it depends on the disability you know some some people they may not have sensations in, in places where they did right so it's being able to find that you know i have one client where he uses his thumb like if it were his penis oh okay yeah how does that work where you're starting to like redefine where your pleasure zones are so what we do is, again, it's going back to the blueprint. Like I asked him to find out what feels good on his body. And he was actually able, his partner, who was an abled person, you know, it's an interabled relationship. And so she was able to touch him in places where he really felt great. And that was one place that really turned him on. And she massaged it like it were, if it were his penis. And so it's all about exploring. It's exploring your body. But again, it's being ready to do that. You know, again, everyone's on their own journey, but that's one exercise that I always recommend. It's a, it's going back to sensate focus, which is a type of uh, exercise that we use in sex therapy, where it's kind of like mindfulness 2.0, and you're kind of touching the different points on your body that feel good to you with no, with no, um, with no uh, wanting the idea of really wanting to have sex, if sex is your goal, that's great. But if you're just trying to explore pleasure again for yourself and what feels good, there's a series of touching that you can do. And that's one thing that I've recommended. 
That's incredible. Could you, um, I know you did the most amazing show notes, which will go up in full. Um, but if you have some recommendations of, you talked about some literature, some erotic literature, um, mm -hmm. some alternatives, hopefully to Pornhub that um, do not <laughs> exemplify violence and underage sex. That would be awesome. I have a huge issue with Pornhub, um, but yeah. I have no issues with porn. It would be great if you had some of the resources. I think that'd be incredible to put up. So one talk. of the things that I always recommend, there is a Sensate Focus book by, um, there's there's two women that uh, wrote a book on Sensate Focus. Um, Linda Widener is one of the, her names, and then there's the other person who I can't think of at this time, but if you just Google that, like the Sense8 Focus book. Okay, I, I keep hearing Sense8 because my uh, co-host is in love with that show. I, I'm assuming that's not <laughs> what we're talking about. Sense8, it's S-E-N-S-A-T-E, Sense8 Focus. Got it. I will have a link to that in the show notes if anyone's curious. Yes. It's and your book should be coming out soon. Yeah, in 2021, my book will be coming out and I will have uh, different exercises in my book. There's going to be a whole chapter in there on sex, uh, reclaiming sexuality, on looking at um, what's pleasurable to you through a series of touch, but also the thought process because thoughts drive behavior. So looking at how to restructure thoughts to be more sexual, to um, address the anxious thinking and the depressive thinking that comes with chronic illness. So I'm going to be talking a lot about that. Um, another great book that I really like to recommend too for couples when you're wanting to become um, intimate again is The Seven Principles of Making Marriage Work by John Gottman, G-O-T-T-M-A-N. That is a wonderful book. It's got a series of exercises that you can do with your partner on enhancing um, what he calls your love maps with each other. Because in my work, I have found that um, most couples need to reclaim their emotional stability in their relationship after there has been a diagnosis of a chronic illness or there's a disability. And then once there's this foundation of emotional stability, then they go into looking at sexuality. Um, and he does a good job of reconnecting that. Another great book that I love too is called Getting the Love You Want. Um, and that is by Harville Hendricks, H-A-R-V-I-L-L-E, -L -L -E, and Hendricks, H-E-N-D-R-I-X. Fabulous book on looking at an unconscious partnership on why people are together, and then looking at a conscious partnership. And he gives a series of exercise on how to build intimacy um, with uh, partners. And I really enjoy his work too. He's the founder of Imago, relationship therapy, um, which is a great therapy on, on, on um, you know, enhancing intimacy with your partner and how to deal with conflict. So those are the books that I, I love to recommend. Another great book is The Ultimate Guide to Kink. Uh, and I'm not gonna get her last name. I, I'm not sure what the spelling is, but Tristan Terramino. It's a great book. Um, so you talked about um, media in your in your show notes, and I wanted to explore that because I can definitely see your point. But I was really excited this year when a show called Sex Therapy, Sex Therapy, Sex Education came out education. on Netflix, and they have a disabled character who has a sex life. They have uh, different body types, different like they go through all sorts of stuff with kink. I was wondering what your thoughts are because I thought this was such a huge push forward in our ideas of casting, of media exposure. Oh, absolutely. Well, it goes back to the idea of the misconceptions that, that people with chronic illness and disability aren't sexual. So anytime there's something that's coming out in the media and pushing the buttons, that's great. I think it's a great foundation. It's laying it out there that people are sexual and, and, and can be very sexual. And that's why I do the work that I do to really help people um, become sexual or to explore sexuality. So anytime there's a new show, which it's, <laughs> when have we had that, right? <laughs> I mean, Julian Anderson has always been like, you know, yeah. X-Files on a hero of mine, but that show, I I just, um, I fell in love with that show of um, how, norm how they normalized everything and um, how nothing yeah. was shameful except well, cruelty. The only right. thing that was shameful was cruelty. Yes, well, I love that you bring that up because that's really what we do in therapy is we normalize things, right? That 
It's okay that you're sexual. It's okay that you're having feelings of wanting to try different things or that you have a fetish if you have a kink, right? That's what sex positivity means. It's being open to sexuality as long as it's consensual and it's not harmful to someone, you know, if there's no consent, right? But as long as it's consent, it's pleasurable, it's something that that helps you. I mean, we're seeing a big um, shift now with sexuality where people are really um, using sex to help cope with certain things, you know, to help cope with, with the chronic illness and disability that they have and to be more in touch with their bodies. So it's very, very powerful what we're seeing now in the field. I, mean, I did hear a rumor that like orgasm is supposed to drop pain by 30%. I have no idea if that's true or not. I like to believe it, but. Yes, research has shown a lot of with that, you know, that that is um, a case that can happen, but also it helps your immune system too. I, there's yeah. a lot of pluses. If I, it, I'm hoping that that also works for self fulfillment and masturbation, but I have no yes. idea. I think the numbers should probably be about the same for that as well. It really helps with, for relaxation purposes when people are very stressed and they're anxious. You know, a lot of times people, they don't really have the desire to want to have sex with someone, but they may have solo sex or masturbation because that provides them pleasure and comfort and it can help you sleep and it releases um, endorphins in your body. You know, a lot of people, you know, they talk about that in therapy that after they have an orgasm, they get very sleepy and it, and it helps them... Um, relax and to go to bed at night. So there's a lot of reasons why, you know, a lot of great benefits of masturbation. And so um, many less side effects than sleeping pills. I mean. That's <laughs> true. <laughs> less side effects. Absolutely. It, it really does a lot for you. And, and when you have a partner, you can get very creative with it. You know, I always, um, one of the things I always, uh, you know, you know, tell people is that, you know, it's, 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 you get creative and you communicate with your partner on, um, you know, what you're feeling. And when you can do that and you can get to a place that brings you pleasure, well, then it's another great way to cope. And, you know, we all need the most coping we can get. <laughs> Absolutely. And people are looking for different ways to cope. And so, you know, mindfulness, meditation, cognitive work, um, doing a self inventory of your emotions every morning when you wake up, where are you feeling the most pain, right? I always recommend a body inventory. You know, if you're feeling pain in an area, um, how, how are you going to pay attention to that, that day, right? What do you have to do? It's okay to say no. It's okay to set those boundaries. Um, you know, I always talk about pacing for pain. So if you feel good one day, do not clean your entire house. We're going to disagree on this one. <laughs> the house will never get cleaned if I don't do that. Uh, well, I mean, you, you know, you have to do what you have to do, but I think it's important to be careful because if you push yourself too much, then sometimes you're down for the count for a few days, but everyone's body's different. You know what? That's what's great about working in this field is, is that everyone is going to process things differently and, you know, it, things are going to work better for others you know, and um, that's what I love about this work and being able to help people um, cope with pain, but also to become more sexual. And they're finding that the more sexual I become, it helps my self-esteem. It helps me cope with my illness and disability. It helps me build connections with other people. It helps me build um, a sense of community um, which I think is very helpful. And so that's one thing that I do too, is I really um, encourage people to join different groups, to join, um, if you just, there's different, there's Fet Life, which is really good for the kink community. Um, there's several different podcasts out there in different literature and books. So it's always great stuff. So you talked a lot about getting people to a point where they want to have sex, but there's a lot of people who don't want to have sex or yeah. they, um, they're they more into the, the asexual romantic. Mm -hmm. How can people um, who are not necessarily wanting sex, but wanting connection or maybe even not that, how can they participate in their own space? I, I don't have a full understanding of this at all. I'm assuming you have much, much clearer ideas. Well, with that asexuality, it's the idea of not being sexually attracted to people, right? So most of the time when someone is asexual or ace, they call it, they're not going to be. 
You know, it's very rare that I have an asexual person in therapy, but I've had um, maybe one or two clients that have been. And so for them, they really want to build a connection with other folks who are asexual. You know, that's why organization and clubs really help to be able to talk about that um, in a space. Or I've had folks that are also um, demisexual, where they have to be emotionally secure with someone or have an emotional connection before they become sexually attracted to someone. And demisexuality falls on the spectrum of asexuality. Um, what's interesting is that people that are asexual, they do masturbate. <laughs> And they may not masturbate to porn. They may not masturbate because they're turned on. They may masturbate because it feels, it gives them a sense of relaxation. Mm. So just because you masturbate and you're asexual, it does not mean you're going to want to go out and have sex. So it's very different for everyone um, and how they, how they do that. But anytime I have a client that falls into that spectrum, or even if they're non-binary, I always recommend... Um, doing some type of, get involved in some type of group to where they can have support. Because I always ask, I always ask my clients, you know, who's your support outside of therapy? And how do people who might feel very isolated or not have family or a partner or how do they find support? Well, they find support through psychotherapy. <laughs> I mean, I would really recommend therapy more than anything. You know, if you are needing support, but you're not getting that because you're far from your family, you're not close to your family, you don't have a partner. Seeking a therapist can be extremely helpful. A sex therapist um, is, is great, you know, to build that connection. And the sex therapist will be able to refer you to some resources in your city or your state that you're in. Um, you can also go to the American, um, Association of Sexuality, Educators, Counselors, and Therapists website, which is www.asect, which is A-A-S-E-C-T uh, dot org, and you can um, receive various resources there as well. That can be very, very helpful. Now, we have a listening audience that spans like the globe. Um, and there's not sex therapists in every country. Um, is this is a good resource for people who are in other areas um, that might not be as uh, open or? Yes, because there is a, there's a resource tab on the website where they offer literature. So that was at the top of the show notes, by the way, everyone. So if you have our show notes and you didn't catch that yeah. website, it'll yeah. be at the very top. Mm -hmm. ASECT is great because, you know, yes, it's established here in the States, but you know, they offer like different various um, research uh, literature for folks in terms of reclaiming sexuality, looking at uh, sexual desire and all those different things. Absolutely. So for um, also for people who can't afford you or a therapist or there's um, I, I'm sure you're aware there's a huge shortage of therapists in the United States. So in the middle of the country, you have states with maybe one or two therapists. Is this a place where someone could go to find an online therapist or if someone doesn't have the funds for a therapist, is there a good um, resource? One thing that I would, yeah. One thing that I would really recommend that you do is go to psychologytoday.com and then you can put in the zip code where you live and the different therapists will come up. Um, that, that's a good resource because they really, psychology today, they really do reach out to the public. So anywhere where you live, you can, you can find that. Or if you simply put in therapists in your area, you can see what comes up. But you know, we're in a, we're in a, we're in an age where telehealth is becoming such a big thing. And so a lot of therapists are offering their services, uh, via telehealth which is great. Um, and you can also do that too, if you're living in an area where you can't find a therapist. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I'm always just concerned about the, the cost for everyone as well, because um, we almost went like under trying to pay for therapy in the household. Like it's, um, yeah. it's such an important thing to be able to have, but absolutely not as affordable. <laughs> it's not, yeah, it's very difficult because there are a lot of therapists out there that don't take health insurance. Um, there are some that do, but a lot of them will have sliding fee scales and some do pro bono work. I mean, I, I am all about a believer of helping people and I love, you know, 
I will definitely do slide and scale fees with clients if I need to. We'll come up with a payment plan, whatever can fit their needs because therapy, it's such a great place because you're talking to someone, you know, they're not a friend, they're not a family member, but they're trained in this area, but they can be a great sense of support. Um, to give to you when when it's really needed at a time where you're where you're where you're struggling with different things. That is uh, precisely why we keep this podcast completely free. All of it. There's yeah. no nothing behind a paywall is um, because it, you know this is what we can do is to get information out there. So I was going through your show notes, and one of the things I want to talk about was self esteem. Um, and sexuality, especially you know, those of us who are on new medications, which can cause dietary issues, stomach mm-hmm. gastro issues, um, huge swings of weight on either side. Um, how does this work in? Well, a lot of times, you know, a lot of people have a lot of sexual side effects due to medications, right? And also to body image sometimes. So I am a therapist that is all about body acceptance and accepting yourself. I practice health at every size. Um, So what I really try to do is work on the self-esteem and why the self-esteem is low and how do we get it back up? And I think the way that we do that is we identify the strengths that you do have and then we run with those strengths. You know, a lot of times when people um, come into therapy, there are different therapists out there. So sometimes there are psychotherapists and sex therapists that only focus on the problem, but I don't like to do that so much. I think it's critical to look at what are your strengths? What makes you you? How do you identify with yourself? What makes you special in the world? What, what gives you pleasure? What, makes you, what, what causes happiness if you have that? That's critical when it comes to building self-esteem. And how do we get there? Um, you know, because there are medications that can cause, I mean, you know, medications, they're great, but they're not great. You know, they can help ease depression. They can help with anxiety. Of course, if you've got an illness, there's medications. But there's also so much more. And that's why psychotherapy is becoming the cutting edge treatment for chronic pain. Because doctors, they can only do so much. But in therapy, we can talk about your feelings and your emotions and how does that relate to your sexuality? And how does that relate to your pain? and and the pleasure that you want to have. You know, one thing that's really important is that just, I find that just holding the space for someone to talk will really help. It goes very, very far. And in a doctor's office, you don't get that all the time. You get 15 minutes, you're in, you're out. But in psychotherapy, you're there for 45 minutes to an hour. That's uh, a very important distinction. You actually have someone who's not just reading your chart. That's, or yeah, didn't read your chart. I, yeah, I have no files in my hands. I have no paper in my hands. I'm not writing in therapy. I'm listening. I'm talking. I'm helping you make decisions. I help a lot of clients with chronic illness. Um, one of the things that we do that they really love is we jot down th- questions that they want to ask their doctor. Mm. No, seriously, like if, if I can give anyone one tip, if you have a cell phone, create a file in either your notes or your Google Keep that is just a running list of questions for your doctor. Like it's almost, I get um, a uh, white coat freeze. I see a white coat, I just start freezing. Like I can't yes. think. So having yeah. that is so helpful. Yeah. A lot of people do. A lot of people get white coat freeze. They get very anxious. They get nervous. So when they get anxious, what happens when you get anxious? You get fight or flight. You either want to run out of the room or you want to fight it. But if you fight it, you don't know what you're going to say. So yeah. I help clients really understand their emotions as it relates to their illness and the things that they want to ask their doctors. But I have found that when people can cope with their depression and their anxiety and their sexual concerns, they're able to manage their illness a lot better and their pain better. I, I really do believe that there is a thing where Um, when you're able to decrease symptoms of depression, anxiety, stress, you can manage the pain better. But when you're more anxious and you're more depressed and you're very stressed, what does that do? That can increase pain levels and it creates low sexual desire. And so when you're able to focus on that and decrease those levels, then we find that people become more sexual too, which is really interesting during the time. I know we weren't going to talk about COVID-19, but it's just so fascinating how these how a lot of my clients with illness they're used to being in isolation right 
but they're calling me and they're like, you know, Dr. Phillips, I'm really horny. <laughs> I think you're the only like business someone could call and say that and it was not an <laughs> inappropriate. Isn't, Isn't that awesome? And they're like, I really want to um, have sex. And I know I'm doing this whole social distancing thing, which I really call it more physical distancing because we're being sociable right now, but I mean, I think that with the- I don't think I've ever been so social with my FaceTime wine dates with my friends. We're having FaceTime tea dates. Like I am like more social now than I ever have been. I have my first virtual birthday party tomorrow night. Oh, I forgot we were close on birthdays. Yay, happy almost birthday. Not mine, I'm going to one. Oh, well, happy <laughs> birthday to them. Happy birthday to <laughs> So I'm really excited. I've never done a virtual party before. I, I, this is a crazy, wonderful time for those of us who've been in isolation who are not necessarily introverted and kind of bodily forced into introversion with all of our friends home and now discovering how great it's FaceTime really, and Zoom is. <laughs> it's really hard for me. I'm, I have to admit, it's, it's, I'm, I'm having a difficult time. Because how are you dealing with it? How are you processing the, the sudden... Oh my gosh. Um, thank you so much for asking. Well, you know, I'm, I'm practicing mindfulness. I am spending a lot of quality time with my husband. We're watching movies. I'm catching up on shows that I used to like love. Um, oh, it's so funny. I have to share the story because this will make people- I'm sorry, but please tell me you're watching the Tiger documentary. I'm no? Watching that. I'll have to. <laughs> oh my God. I can't even process this show. It's on Netflix. It's a uh, Joe Exotic. I, I you just please watch the. Oh, I'll have all to my watch. friends who are therapists are on Facebook. Just like I, I don't even know. <laughs> I'm always looking for new things to watch. I'll have to check that out. But no, it's really funny. So I told my husband the other day. I said I want to go to a bookstore and I want to get a novel. I don't want to get a nonfiction book. I don't want to read about sex. I don't want to read about chronic illness. I don't want to read about psychology. I want a novel that I can get lost in during this time. And of course, I go to the bookstore and I'm looking around, I'm looking at all these novels and nothing is piquing my interest. I'm like, nope, don't want to read that. That's depressing. That's too sad. That's too whatever, cheesy. And of course, I walk out of there with a sex book. <laughs> I ended up getting a sex therapy book. But it's just funny because I was trying to get out of my comfort zone and do something different. Um, but hey, I'm watching different TV shows and, you know, uh, relaxing, taking walks. Um, you know, we have a lot of cases here in DC. Um, you know, I know California is very crazy right now with numbers too, but getting out and getting some fresh air, you know, if you can get out and walk around and just try to find the things that are positive right now. That's what's critical during this time. But, but anytime you're, you're battling chronic pain and chronic illness, you know, just trying to find those things that bring you some joy. It's, it's so critical and so important. Well, if you want a book, I just bought this book for someone from my local bookstore who delivered it. Um, the 10,000 Doors of January is my favorite book from here on out. I, I was a literature major. I'm a bookworm. This is like the best book I've ever read. So if you need like a good escape from the world book that is not a sex education book, this is like my favorite literature book ever. Oh, I'm going to have to get it. Please oh, do. I, I'm in love I, with this book. I will get it. You know, if you're recommending it. Hey, okay. I'll definitely check it out. It was my favorite escape. I had dislocated my wrist really violently at like 10 o'clock at night and I have my iPhone, which I can just hold with one hand. And I read about 200 pages in like until four in the morning. I forgot about my wrist. So if it can make you forget about a dislocated wrist, I'm definitely selling this book. This is like my favorite. She does not pay me. I'm in love with this book. Uh, I did want to cover one more thing before we go. And um, you talked about like the different stages of things and that there's like stages where you just can't. You, you're just, that's not, you're in a survival mode. Mm -hmm. How can, um, how can you stay connected as a couple, a couple, a poly, a self, how can you stay, um, not necessarily sexual, but still appreciating being in a body? Like, how can you, as a partner, as a friend, yep. not necessarily romantic or sexual, but how can you keep so, either intimacy yeah. with yourself or with others? Sure. No, that's a great question. One of the things that I recommend if I'm working with couples, mm -hmm. I always recommend check-ins, that you check in with each other. You put it on a calendar. It's not about sex. It's not about intimacy, but just having a time where you check in because, you know, 
no matter what type of world you're living in, what you're doing, we're always on autopilot mode. We're on autopilot mode with ourselves. We're on autopilot mode if we've got children, if we have jobs, if we have, a, you know, hey, Spoonies have tons of appointments to go to. You know what I mean? So having check-ins, putting it on the calendar, hey, at eight o'clock on Friday, this is my check-in with my throttle, with my partner, with my partners, you know, just having a conversation, checking in with each other. It doesn't have to be this big positive conversation. It's just, hey, what's going on? Is there something that you need from me right now in terms of support, right? If when I work with single people, um, chat rooms, chat lines, friends that you can call, you know, just having some type of support goes really far that way. And because I, you know, I, I do work with a lot of people who are not sexual. They don't, they don't want sex. Sex is the last thing on their minds, right? So they want to have, but they want to have a connection. And so we talk about that and being able to check in. That's critical. That seems like right now, um, like just talking to some friends who are separated from their spouses, either because their spouses are in the healthcare industry or they got separated by borders right now. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like a lot of that can be done via FaceTime or, you know, <laughs> Zoom is really what's going to keep us all Zoom going and Skype. Zoom is taking over the world right now. There's Skype. Make sure your, 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 your volume is up on that because I can't figure mine out. Um, we were having fun for about 15 minutes before this started. <laughs> we were having fun, but we figured it out. We well, did. We, um, we, we got this Zoom. <laughs> But yeah, technology these days, right? FaceTiming, getting on there with people. Um, you know, like what we were talking about earlier, one of the things that I love, you know, recommend for people to do is to definitely um, check out sometimes too. You know, you want to be connected, but you also, to, to be there for yourself, don't always set with your feelings. You know, reading a good book, a novel, getting lost in it, it's a great way to cope with pain, to cope with depression. Those things go far too, but um, check-ins are critical. I always recommend those. Yeah, we have State of the Union at our house with, uh, we have a State of the Union with marriage every like six months or so just to make sure our values are still on go. point. What are we still thinking? What's, that. Yeah, it, it's, um, it is very much a State of the Union. It is not a date night. We go through what we're concerned about, what what we have issues possibly with each other or with our communication or yeah. do we still have the same idea of what we want to do in the next five to 10 years, next 20 years? Are those still lining up? You know, it's, I find it really helpful to have a state of the union from both sides. I love that. I like calling it. I like calling it that. <laughs> that's, that's a great, we're geeks here. Like, <laughs> that's amazing. but no, I think that's important, right? The check-ins, uh, whatever you want that check-in to be, whatever you want to call it. I mean, they're, they're so critical to do with your partner, to do with your friends, because, you know, when you hold your emotions in and you're not processing, that's what we call flooding. It builds and it builds and it builds. And then it's like the floodgates open. But if you're doing check-ins or you're having a conversation and you're getting support, that goes so far. And so I always recommend those. Absolutely. Do you have anything else that you wanted to cover with us? Um, Very wide ranging topic. <laughs> I know we really got into a lot of things. We could have like a show on each of these, but I think the one thing anytime <laughs> yeah, is to check in with your body. Listen to your body. You know, the body really is a foundation that helps the mind. I think do that check in every day where you're at. If you are having this bucket attitude, stay in bed if you have to. Do what you have to do. You don't have to force yourself up. You don't have to, that's where acceptance comes in. Accept your feelings and where you're at in the moment. Don't feel like you've got to challenge everything. Um, that's one thing that I really do stress because I have a lot of people that come in with pain and illness and they say, you know, I have guilt or shame because I should be doing this. I should be getting up. I, I need to clean my house. I have to do this. Well, guess what? Your body's now allowing it today. So do what you have to do to get through the day. That's, I absolutely hear that, but I will say, I hope all of you have the resources to be able to do that because I know some of you who are listening, including myself, do not have the resources to be able to listen to our bodies and stay in bed when we have to. <laughs> so yeah. it's, um, it's wonderful you have those resources, take advantage of that and, and be grateful you have those resources. That's yeah, awesome. if you have resources for that, that's great. If you don't, you know, um, people can always reach out to me, you know, um, so if you ever want to uh, follow me on Instagram, I check my messages there. It's at Dr. Lee Phillips. I'm He's much better checking the messages than I am. He is so much better at that. 
<laughs> please don't get mad at me. Like there are messages in there from like 2017. I like yeah, Monica doesn't check. Monica doesn't check my messages. Um, I'm, I'm really off. I, I am barely hanging on by like fingernails. Eva is trying so hard to clean up after me with like, uh, not being able well, to, to you do, do a great job though. You, you do what you can though. Um, <laughs> And but please follow Dr. Phillips. That's a, a, and also at the top of the show notes will be all the links to follow Dr. Phillips. We yeah, you can the top. follow me, reach out to me, ask me a question. I'm here for support. I'm here to help guide you. Um, you know, if you need a resource, let me know what you're looking for, and I will definitely try to point you in the right direction. That is an amazing and kind resource. And thank you for being on the show again. I really love having you on. It's always a treat. Thank you for having me. I always love being on here with you. Well, everyone, just remember the only shame is cruelty. So um, keep that in mind as you go through your day. This is unprecedented times. So the be kind, be gentle, and be a badass in whatever way that looks like is never been more important. So take care of each other. Take care of yourselves. This has been kind of crazy. And uh, stay as uh, sane as you can and get the $10,000 in January. Trust me, it's like ultimate escape in the world. <laughs> it's a really good one. If you haven't watched Sex Education, please go watch that. That was fantastic. Um, have a great week, everyone. Uh, we are self-funded. So if you want to be a patron, Patreon, oh, never know how to pronounce that. We do have a, an account. We would be very grateful if you can. If that works for you, that's wonderful. If that doesn't, but you still want to support the show, um, sending these episodes out to your friends, family, and social media groups is really, really an act of kindness. So thanks everyone. Have a good week as possible and take care.